Today, we continue our story of Disney artist Herb Ryman, a person who was deeply connected to Hollywood before he worked on Disney films and later became a key designer for Disneyland, the Magic Kingdom, Epcot, and other Disney parks. Last week, we looked at his young life in Illinois, his early interest in art, the death of his father during World War I, his mother's struggles to make a new life for the Ryman family, and Herbie's yearning to go to art school. Today, we'll pick up our story as Herbie goes to art school and eventually moves to California. At the center of this story is not only the life experience of Herb Ryman, but also the story of the ways that live action film production influenced how Disney animation developed in the 1930s and 1940s, and more importantly, how live action film production influenced the development of the Disney parks. It's also the story of Ryman's friendship with Walt himself, two artists from the Midwest who find their way in Hollywood. Out here, right now in California, it's a brisk 59 degrees. It feels like fall. But in our story, we're about to move into the 1930s, the era of the Great Depression. As a young man works on his skills in drawing, oils, and watercolors, and begins to think of himself as an artist. If you're ready, here we go. As Herbie prepared to move to Chicago at the end of the summer 1929, he was warned yet again by his friends and classmates that he was making a mistake. Everyone predicted, terrible failure for me because they said artists can't make a living. Still, he packed up his things and enrolled in the Chicago Art Institute where initially he believed he would start over as a freshman. After the school had an opportunity to observe his ability and review his transcript, they promoted him into the sophomore program. As he settled into his classes and made friends, Ryman finally found himself entering that mythic community he had imagined back in Decatur, a community where people weren't simply training for a career, they were striving for something more, ways to express themselves and to measure their own abilities against artists of the past. He was surrounded by students focused on art all around him, in the hallways and classrooms and across the long walls of the student gallery were sketches and paintings students had completed. In the classroom, he was finally free of math and biology as his studies were now reduced down to just two disciplines, the historical examination and appreciation of art, and studio classes engaged to help students improve their craft and produce new work. I followed a wide variety of fine art and academic trainings, he said. I worshipped Ingres, Michelangelo, Franz Hall, Vermeer, and Rubens. Probably due to his father's influence, he received particularly high honors in a class focused on anatomy, as though the ability to define aspects of the human form in drawing came to him naturally. For the first time in his life, he found a community where most everyone around him shared his ambitions, tossing aside the prospects of a reliable career to paint or draw. At the end of his first year, he didn't return to Decatur for summer break to spend time with friends and family, even though he missed them dearly. Instead, he traveled to an arts colony in Saugatuck, Michigan, where he painted for weeks on end. He knew he had only three years to train himself as a painter, three years that would determine whether he found work as an artist or whether he was forced to support himself in an office or a store. For many urban artists, the Saugatuck colony provided relief from the dirt and noise of the city. Their artists could focus on lakes, forests, and dunes, images that cleansed their minds of the urban decay rising up around Chicago and Detroit. During this period, Herbie developed an identity as an experiential painter. He felt he could better represent a landscape if he walked over its ground, touched its trees, and watched how light moved across its vista. 
He wanted to capture the largeness of the world through realistic images, as had painters who had come before him. But the experience in Sagatuck also reminded him how sheltered he was, how little he had seen. As a boy, he dreamed of visiting distant parts of the world. He had relatives who, for government work, lived overseas. One of them, Alvern Norris, wrote him a couple of times a year from Bangkok, letters in which he explained the intrigue and complexities of life in Asia. In response, Herbie could only tell Alvern about his experiences in Illinois and Michigan. For two months, he painted alongside other artists, many of them his fellow students, brushing out hills, rivers, and fields. Learning about the world was a cycle. He only partially understood a place by visiting it. He didn't actually know it until he drew or painted it. Noticing how tall grass bent in the direction of a breeze or how light passing through a canopy of trees created a lace pattern on the ground or how rocks along a riverbed tended to cluster from smallest to largest up the bank. Only at the end of the summer did he spend a week with his mother and sisters in Decatur. It was the longest he had ever been away from home. He had expected to find an entirely new identity in art school, but that hadn't happened, at least not fully. Instead of a new personality, he had developed twin longings, Part of his heart yearned to create art, but part of his heart yearned to be home around people who had known him his entire life, who understood who he was. There were two kinds of acceptance in the world he was finding. One group of Herbie's friends understood who he wanted to be in the future, and the other understood where he had come from in the past. Even then, he could see he would always return to Decatur no matter where he traveled. To leave Decatur for good would be to abandon those he had known in childhood. If nothing else, the death of his father had taught him this. To give up someone you've known in the past was to give up something essential about yourself as well. He visited his mother, his sisters, and friends. Then he traveled to Chicago to begin his junior year. In 1930, he lived in an apartment with three roommates. At times, he had a girlfriend, Eleanor LeCaff, a girl with short brown hair and a pleasant personality, who often joined Herbie and his friends for dinner. They talked about what they were painting, which classes they liked, and how they would find jobs after graduation, even as the economy continued to decline around them. Starting that year, Herbie returned home more frequently. His first trip happened in October, when his old teacher and mentor, George Rabb, arranged for Ryman's work to be presented at the local Art Institute, ten paintings that Ryman had produced in Chicago and over summer in Michigan. The show was arranged under a familiar banner, Local Student Does Well, but to Herbie, it felt like success, a piece of recognition that somehow signaled good things lay in his future. He presented mostly landscapes done in oils and watercolors, as well as a few portraits and one copy of a work by Rembrandt. His handling of color in building shadows is particularly skillful, the local paper explained, and his feeling for form is highly developed. He returned to Decatur the next month for Thanksgiving and then for Christmas. The following month, Professor Robb discussed a spring show of his work at the Decatur Art Institute. The show was planned for March, and this time, Ryman was invited to fill an entire gallery room with his watercolors, oils, and lithographs made from stone etchings, a technique with which he'd recently experimented. But Herbie wasn't the only member of his family whose professional outlook changed during these years. In 1931, Lucille appeared in plays in and around Decatur. She acted on stage, worked with sets, and promoted the productions. That summer, she applied for and was accepted into an eight-week course at the prestigious Pasadena Playhouse in the hopes of furthering her acting career. 
For this, she would need to move temporarily to California. Just like Herbie, Lucille looked to classes as the means to transform her abilities and eventually find a path that would lead her beyond life as a local high school teacher. By the early 1930s, the Pasadena Playhouse, in addition to being a stage venue, was functioning as an acting school, in large part to train individuals for the growing industry of Hollywood. They held summer programs for experienced actors, mostly from California, though they also accepted students from across the country. Though known as the Playhouse, as though it might have a single stage, the organization was a collection of small venues where directors presented everything from traditional drama to West Coast premieres of major works to experimental productions. Students enrolled in these classes were offered rooms in nearby houses modified to function as dormitories, creating a residential program similar to the one experienced by Herbie only focused on the dramatic arts. Lucille left Decatur on June 20th, the same day Herbie arrived home for summer break and traveled to the West Coast, where she and other students studied acting, created sets, and participated in stage management. Though most plays produced by the Pasadena community were penned by well-known authors, including Tennessee Williams and Eugene O'Neill, students also worked on their own scripts. One such effort, written by character actor Don DeFore and four of his fellow Pasadena students, premiered at a little theater in Hollywood before moving eventually to Broadway and later as a film script to MGM. At times, film studios looked to the Playhouse as a venue to test a screenplay and development to workshop and revise it. Screen agents also visited the Playhouse to scout for up-and-coming actors and writers. In this, Lucille, perhaps to her surprise, found herself not only in one of the premier stage acting schools in the country, but also a venue that trained actors, writers, and set designers for the growing business of Hollywood. She was, she would later report, the only student in her class without professional experience on the stage or in film. Many of her fellow performers had experience acting for major studios such as Fox or performing on Broadway. Her initial plans were to return to teaching history that fall into Cater, but based on her performance, the Playhouse awarded her an $800 scholarship for the coming academic year, an enormous sum, especially as the country was then sinking into the Depression. After learning of the award, Lucille applied for a one-year leave of absence from her teaching job. This request may have been to appease her mother or to keep her options open, but in reality, she was entering a structured two-year degree program in directing, acting, and stagecraft, a program that she could not complete if she returned to Decatur the following fall. While his sister was in California, Herbie spent time at home with his mother, where, thanks to his old teacher, Professor Rob, he was given studio space in the Decatur Arts Institute to continue work on his paintings. He also spent time once again at an arts colony in Michigan and then returned to Chicago for his third and final year of study. He was among the top students in his class, a position he'd strived to achieve. As in years past, it would almost guarantee him job opportunities as a commercial artist, perhaps with a job in publishing or advertising. He needed just one thing, for the economy to improve by the time he graduated. Again, he exhibited his works back home in the Decatur Arts Institute. This time, his paintings filled two rooms, the Central and West Galleries. Again, his work was praised as colorful, varied, and appealing. By April, it was clear that he would graduate near the top of his class. A handful of his paintings were selected to be displayed around campus during graduation week and into summer. He believed, or at least he wanted to believe, that he would be one of the few to eventually succeed as a fine artist. I thought I had great talent, he said. But 1932 was not a good year to graduate from art school. The lowest point of the Great Depression would be the summer of 32, right when Ryman graduated. 
Very few industries were looking to hire. Across the country, the unemployment rate stood at 24%. Despite academic accolades, no one wanted to hire a young painter, at least not in Chicago or Decatur. All the men who graduated with me from the Chicago Art Institute, talented as they were, Herbie said, couldn't get a job even at $10 a week. Herbie knew, or at least he told himself, that his lack of employment had nothing to do with his own abilities. This was in the midst of a very terrible American depression, he said, where no one could get a job, least of all an artist. Still, the disappointment stayed with him. Here we were, he said, young, innocent, ignorant children, thinking that the world was just waiting for our talents to be revealed. But nothing like that existed for him beyond the classroom, nothing in the Midwest at least. From California, Lucille suggested that Herbie join her for a while. She might be able to arrange a position for him at the Playhouse if he was interested, something where he could study set design and paint sets for Playhouse productions. More importantly, the depression was less severe in Los Angeles than it was in the Midwest. Herbie had no other options other than perhaps finding a job in the school system his mother ran. Though he had some high school experience as an actor, he had never thought of looking to the stage for work after art school. It was a step down from the world of publishing and advertising. But he had only two options. Admit that his mother had been right about the futility of an art degree and move home or travel to California and study at the Playhouse. As he looked out at the world, he didn't see many good opportunities. During the second week of June, Cora and Christine traveled together up to Chicago, where they watched Herbie graduate in cap and gown. They admired his paintings, they talked with his instructors, they learned he had graduated magna cum laude, near the top of his class. Then they packed up his things for his trip back to Decatur. There, he would spend one week visiting with family and old friends. Then he would travel to California, hoping to adapt his art skills for the stage. By her second summer with the Pasadena Playhouse, Lucille was deeply involved with its productions, finding in California a new life that she loved far more than her life as a high school teacher back home. At this time, the Playhouse had three stages. The main stage was primarily used for public performances. A new show is opened every other Thursday night and runs for 11 performances, she explained. The workshop stage was where new works, sometimes from famous playwrights, were developed in the hope that if successful, they might be slotted for a two-week run on the main stage. The workshop stage was also used by movie directors trying to improve a script. The private stage was saved for personal projects. Selected by the Playhouse director, the audience there was typically students. In terms of formal training, the students shifted between roles, from acting to directing to set design to stage management. Over months, Lucille spent time in each of these roles, and on stage she played a range of characters, from a maid to a flapper to a blind woman, often working alongside actors who were regularly seen on the big screen. When Herbie arrived in early July, he found his sister with a lead part in a show called Hollywood Review. It was one of the largest roles she had earned. He moved in with her, then took a six-week summer course on set design, hoping that he could eventually make a living with the theater. We lived together, Ryman said. These were terribly depressed periods, and we lived on nothing but they found ways to make ends meet, if just barely. You could get a suit for $12, he said, a pair of shoes for $2, rent was cheap. Beyond the theater, he briefly opened his own studio in a low-rent second-floor space on Olvera Street, hoping to sell his art. There, he painted and experimented with a variety of media. Some scenes seem to demand oil, he said, and others are clearly meant to be done in black and white. 
By this point, he was beginning to focus his efforts on landscapes, river walks and groups of trees, an adobe church beneath thick clouds, and houses on a hill just outside of a copper mine. He thought of himself as a serious artist. He displayed his work as had his teachers in Chicago. He talked about how art had the potential to change society. But as Ryman recalled, not a single customer ever came to browse, much less purchase one of my treasures. He closed the studio after two months and looked for work elsewhere. He created a few advertisements for local businesses. He did some design work for the Pasadena Airport. He helped finalize puppets for a children's theater in Los Angeles. But beyond this, he found little to support himself. I thought I had great talent, he said. I was moody and prone to melancholy at the time. He had hoped that Los Angeles would broaden his horizons, but he mostly spent time at the theater complex and in the small apartment he shared with Lucille, making short excursions into town. Hardly anyone was hiring artists, hardly anyone except for the Disney studio. By the midpoint of 1932, Ryman was aware of the Disney studio as it was only 10 miles from the Pasadena Playhouse. At the time, Disney was focused on two film series, Mickey Mouse and the Silly Symphony cartoons. The Disney characters were rounded and expressive, but largely based on either animals, such as dogs, mice, and cows, or inanimate objects, such as clocks, plates, and toys. This studio employed the exact type of artist that Ryman, with his art school education, wanted to avoid. Caricature artists who were either self-trained or who had started out as newspaper illustrators. I was not a cartoonist, Ryman said. I was a portrait painter. I was a fine artist. Becoming a cartoon animator would be yet another step down from his goals as a commercial or fine artist, a step far lower than he was willing to take. But animation, he soon learned, wasn't the only opportunity for artists in Hollywood. Live-action studios also hired artists, though the work of artists there was more invisible than that of animators. Artists at live-action studios created sketches and paintings to guide craftspeople as they created sets and facades, and to guide technicians as they laid out important shots. This work, Ryman discovered, was far closer to the type of work valued in art school, images that artfully and accurately represented the real world. In 1932, Los Angeles was home to five major Hollywood studios, Fox, MGM, Paramount, RKO, and Warner Brothers, each with its own art department. Ryman knocked on many doors, but found that no one needed another artist. Most of the studios were either full up or downsizing. After working his way around town, he finally got a good lead. A friend of my sister, he explained, who was a studio artist at MGM, said that I could maybe come over there and be an artist. Herbie was given the name of an art director, Cedric Gibbons, who had worked on hundreds of films. Gibbons oversaw the art department and therefore oversaw art direction on each film, even if he wasn't listed as the art director per se. Without realizing the full significance of Gibbons' role, Ryman put together materials that would showcase his work, hoping that this name might finally lead to reliable work. Portfolio in hand, Ryman ventured to the MGM lot, a studio so large it was practically a town. The complex was a row of shops and offices, as well as a theater beyond which were sound stages and outdoor shooting locations. Around the production facilities were bungalows, dining areas, park-like green spaces, also a school for child actors. The lot employed 2,500 people, which was five times the number of residents in Pulaski, Illinois, the town where Ryman had spent his early years. The name Gibbons easily got him through the gate. Once on the lot, Ryman met with the head of the special effects department, Buddy Gillespie, who also had experience as an assistant art director and a set designer. 
Gillespie considered his qualifications and looked over his samples. He noted that Ryman had no previous experience with motion pictures, and aside from a few weeks at the Playhouse, no experience with set design either. Moreover, he was trained primarily as a painter and not as the type of quick sketch artist central to studio work. But Gillespie also knew that the studio needed an artist with solid drawing skills to work up designs. Gillespie then lifted his eyes to Ryman, who sat across from him in a tie and jacket. Uh, we have a man who's going back to New York, he said, and you're just at the right time. Possibly you could take his place. Ryman said he could start work at any time. As opposed to other studios, MGM was moving toward productions with lavishly produced environments, also films with a strong sense of character depth. As the most literary of the early studios, MGM developed hundreds of scripts based on novels, works of history, biography, and stage plays with a penchant for historical dramas. Executives believed that realistic characters required realistic sets to create a deeply believable film. Over at RKO and Paramount, the majority of their productions were set in contemporary American cities. Beyond that, Warner Brothers, for example, was building their reputation around gangster films. Such projects, Ryman would later explain, required a good script and good direction, and no more than a few stock walls to frame in the sets. In contrast, MGM developed jungle adventures, tales of romance set overseas, and political dramas set decades in the past. One key to MGM's success was to produce all of these pictures on their backlot. This was an expensive lesson executives had learned 10 years earlier during the production of Ben-Hur. Initially, the studio sent the director, camera operators, and actors over to Rome, believing that the film would be more engaging and realistic if filmed there. After spending $2 million and viewing the results, executives called the production back to the studio, where ancient Rome, including a coliseum for the chariot race, was created on the back lot. Within months, they saw that footage produced on the lot was superior to reels shot overseas. From that point forward, MGM created elaborate sets on its back lot, sets designed by artists and architects built by craftspeople and construction workers. In addition to its main lot, MGM currently owned additional lots around town, as the complex was technically a combination of three early studios, giving MGM plenty of land and stages for its productions. To create these sets, a studio art director, sometimes with the help of an assistant or two, read over a script, made a few notations, and then discussed the project with the film's director. From that point, Cedric Gibbons and his assistants made a series of rough sketches, typically on 3 by 4 inch cards, to visualize key sets, define camera positions, and consider lighting needs. Based on these rough drawings, the art director, director, and technical team discussed the set requirements in terms of costs, backlot ability, and other concerns. Once everyone was in agreement, these roughs were handed over to a sketch artist such as Ryman to create highly detailed pencil or charcoal drawings, sometimes paintings as well, that depicted key scenes, largely to guide the production of architectural set designers, set dressers, costume designers, and the prop department. A sketch artist's drawings were more detailed than the art director's roughs. Also, these drawings were far larger, typically on paper that measured 18 by 24 inches. The artwork, arranged as a presentation of key scenes, would give the film visual realism, continuity, complexity, and offer a clear example of how a finished scene would appear on screen. For the most part, all of these artists, except for Cedric Gibbons and a few key art directors, worked anonymously, without seeing their names on screen. 
with this process. More so than other studios, MGM worked toward a production model in which the art department didn't just plan out sets, but established the visual mood of the picture many months, if not a year before cameras took in the first scenes. The full distinction between various studios was likely lost on Ryman when he first arrived at MGM. He did, however, know that the job would be demanding and that he would need to teach himself how to produce the type of drawings the studio found useful. For the most part, Ryman was spared the peculiarities of script language with its camera and lighting direction and worked in a purely visual environment. Ryman worked beneath the art director and the assistant art director, breaking down their visual ideas often with an architect, into individual sketches that would help create the sets, scenery, and props. Hoping to convince others of his professionalism, he showed up for work in a suit and tie. I was terribly young, he said, but at MGM, everybody had called me Mr. Ryman. In ways, he was a kid, dressed up in a slightly older man's clothes, hoping to please those around him with the skills he had acquired in art school. Those skills he soon discovered were very much in need. At the time he was hired, MGM employed a few art directors, but only one sketch artist. The art directors just brought me work, Ryman said. I was working flat out 15 to 20 hours a day, seven days a week. He went from one project to the next, spending about three months on each film and then moving on to a new project. The work was challenging, at times confusing, a series of tasks that stretched his abilities. In art school, he had been given ample time to plan out a composition and then sketch it. Here, he needed to produce one drawing after another, with each having the feeling of a complete work. I wanted to hold that job if it killed me, he said. MGM was a company focused on growth. Along with Louis B. Mayer, the studio's co-founder and money man, the person most responsible for the studio's early success was Irving Thalberg, head of production, who guided films towards lavish set designs, elegant costumes, and expensive ensemble casts. Thalberg's strategy to create visually enticing films often relied on extensive pre-production work largely completed by an art department overseen by Cedric Gibbons. Thalberg also established a preview system whereby finished films were reviewed by test audiences with problematic sequences reshot, a strategy that was used so often that in industry circles, MGM was jokingly referred to as Retake Valley, but this system of audience previews helped Thalberg understand the changing entertainment tastes of Americans. If a scene didn't play well in San Bernardino or Fontana, not only did he change it, he adjusted his understanding of what Americans enjoyed in the movies. Thalberg saw studio features as the art of arts, meaning not only was it a popular form, but also that film was an amalgam of other arts, from storytelling to acting, from music to costuming, from painting to architecture. As such, Thalberg understood the work of individual artists, from composers to choreographers to sketch artists, as they all contributed to the final production. If Lucille was focused on the Pasadena Playhouse, and ensemble theater that often worked toward artistic expression, Ryman had been hired by a studio whose ensemble aim was to integrate the arts toward unique productions, often supported by extensive budgets. In this now, he was in the center of Hollywood. I'll be back next Sunday to continue our story about Disney artist Herb Ryman. And over on Bandcamp, you'll find new material added this past week that continues to expand our audio guide to Disney World.
If you'd like to support our podcast by becoming a monthly Bandcamp subscriber, you can do so by visiting our Bandcamp site. On Bandcamp, you'll find over a hundred episodes not available on iTunes, but the best reason to join is to support the work we do here and to make sure that this podcast continues to exist. You can become a monthly subscriber at dhipodcast.bandcamp.com. And until next time, this is Todd James Pierce.